This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 743, recorded on April 13th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommiers. Hello, Vincent and everybody else. Um, looking out my window, it's finally cleared out. It was raining yesterday and the day before, but today is beautiful with sunny skies and about a 55 to 60 degree temperature. I haven't really actually measured it, so I'm not sure what it is, but it's nice out there. Yeah, blue skies, 15C from where I'm sitting. 15, okay. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 77 degrees and cloudy. That's all I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> and also joining us here from Columbia University in New York City, Amy Rosenfeld. Welcome back. Hello. We're in the annex Hi. today. We're in the annex, but it seems quiet, right? Well, nobody is in that. Nobody populates the annex but me. <laughs> okay. The lab of one. Change your name to annex. Exactly. <laughs> Annie Lennox. <laughs> Annie Lennox. Exactly. Hey, I used to be a big arrhythmics fan. Yeah, me too. Annie Annex. Maybe yeah. she should show you. What happened to <laughs> Annie Lennox? She broke up, right? And then she went on her own. And then what happened? Did she, she, she broke up. She got a divorce. She wrote, a, she wrote some sad songs and made a very, uh, the album was called Bear. Mm-hmm. And I used to actually listen to it all the time while I was uh, painting at the Art Students League. And I know every song by heart. Yeah. It's really, uh, yeah. I mean, she had a terrible breakup with the bass player that was the uh, hmm. second lead in Eurythmics. So that when she broke up, I guess they called themselves the Eurythmics. <laughs> <laughs> actually, she still, I think she still <laughs> performs. I yeah. think she, you know, like Sting still performs. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She, I think she she's does. still, I just don't that's think she correct. tours. That's exactly right. Sting, yeah, I don't Sting, think she tours uh, outside the UK. That's, that's also Sting, true. Sting performs for Dixon, right? Uh, he performed for your book. I mean, he wrote he wrote something for your book, right? Well, yes and no. He did. He, he wrote a blurb <laughs> and uh, he gave it a, gave it pretty Pretty good. Um, it was fine. Did he Let's read it? Do you think way. he read it or not? Uh, he, he read the original manuscript because oh, okay. uh, it was given to him by somebody. This is uh, um, uh, Vertical Farm, right? That was the name of the book? That's correct. That is the name That's of the exactly book. That's exactly right. Okay. That is the name of the book. Speaking of Vertical Farms, not, yes. nothing really, <laughs> actually. We are. It is Tuesday and we are... Uh, going to continue to educate you about virology in general. And uh, we have a paper for you, followed by some emails, every one of which has to do with COVID, so stay tuned. But today, we have a paper from Nature Microbiology. It is called, The Shape of Pleomorphic Virions Determines Resistance to Cell Entry Pressure. And the authors are Lee, Lee, Deans, Mittler, Lou, Chandran and Ivanovich from Brandeis University and, of course, Kartik Chandran from Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And I thought this would be interesting. Last week we talked about syncytia. <laughs> right, right, right. And today we're going to talk about uh, pleomorphic virus particles. So I would say the title virions, uh, you know, Virion is an infectious particle, so I don't know. If, I would have said virus particle, but that's fine. <laughs> but, you know, some, some viruses uh, are pleomorphic. In fact, we mentioned that when we talked about the, the respiratory syncytial virus paper a couple of weeks ago. They can package extra genome, extra RNA, and Quite other a viruses. Bit sometimes, right? Uh, well, sorry? Quite a bit of yeah, genome. Yeah, apparently I was they quite said surprised to nine that. nine genome copies. That's amazing. That's incredible. That's yeah. So anyway, this is about pleomorphic particles and what they might mean. And influenza viruses, I, I am the most familiar with because they can be spherical or actually quite filamentous. Newcastle disease virus, respiratory syncytial, syncytial virus, as we mentioned, measles virus, and Ebola virus is also pleomorphic, although. You know, you may be familiar with it as a 
filament, philo virus, right? It's a fil or thread in Latin. Uh, Nipa and yes, Andra. But they're all negative strand that you're railing off. Like they are. You'd have to, yeah. The only R positive strand that comes to mind is Corona. All the other positive stranded RNA viruses are structured. They are. So that may have something to do with not being pleomorphic, right? I have a Wikipedia definition of pleomorphism <laughs> in microbiology. Okay. Just in case there's anybody who's not got this locked down. In microbiology, pleomorphism is the ability of some microorganisms to alter their morphology, biological functions, or reproductive modes in response to environmental conditions. Hmm. Okay. So that's yeah. a little that's a little a little more than I would have expected. I just think of it as uh, you know, variety of a variety in shape. Our, our uh, yeah, and, and actually malleability in shape. Yeah, but I have a problem with the definition that you just read. So okay. it's a, it suggests that you are selected because it says under environmental pressures. Right. And there's in this paper, there's no selection. Right. So the whole point is of this paper is non-genetically encoded. So there's no selection. It's all just by chance. Right. So I don't know that Wikipedia has it a hundred percent correct. It's the sure first time Wikipedia has ever been any less than one hundred percent. And the well, other thing is, is coronas are all they're some degree of spherical. They're considered poly pleomorphic structurally and there's some degree of spherical plus or minus some you know let's say 15 percent or 15 degrees towards oval and non non-spherical but they're never filamentous right. but yet structural people will say that they're pleomorphic yeah so, so again but rich red though was i thought a, a more general yeah microbiological definition. So I think of things like slime molds and fungi yeah. that have several different forms depending on the environment. Dixon and is so that, I think that it applies to those organisms probably more than it does a lot of other things. Are, are any parasites pleomorphic, Dixon? The trypanosomes, hmm. when they infect a host, like our African trypanosomes, they are they're the short, stumpy forms or the long forms. And nematodes, of course, go through lots of uh, length changes as well, or stumpy. Uh, we call some um, <coughs> rhabditiform larvae and others filariform larvae. So, you know, the biologists have a, a penchant for looking back in history for all these ancient descriptors. And then mm. out of Homeric similes, they start <laughs> naming them. You're trying to find out where they came from. And it's, it's, a, it's a tangle. It's a, it's a, you know, this guy, Kevin, would be fantastic just to tell us about that. Dixon, He's a regular um, on our TWIP show. And, Dixon, um, um, so, so some parasites. Are you going too much here? No, no, no. <laughs> I, I just wanted to make yes. a distinction. So, for example, malaria has different forms as it goes through its phases, right? Those it does. Those are different stages. Stage. So that would be That's called stages. stages. Right. And pleomorphism is differences in, I don't know, the final product, I guess. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Okay. Well, I don't, I don't know. No? You could say they're capable of pleomorphism when they, when the slime molds go from single cells when they aggregate into these huge colonies. I don't know. The definition of pleomorphic is pleomorphic. Exactly. <laughs> you can't use the word as you can't He's use the word in its own definition. He's joking. But um, <laughs> when you go from single cell to multi-cells as a slime mold, does the cell shape actually change? It doesn't so go then, to a multi-cell. It, it's not a multi-cell. Well, cellular. when it aggregates. Yes. It right, looks, but the it cell, looks, the individual cell shape is still the same. Apparently. But it's now just, they can form a structure that none of right. them can form otherwise. Right, but. It's quite remarkable, actually. Right, but is that really a change in cell shape? Or is that just an aggregate? It's not a change in shell, cell shape. It's a change in response to the environment. And then they right, but form so these then large I, aggregates. I, right. So then I don't understand how it's pleomorphic. Well, because the actual individual I see what cell you're saying. No, I see what you're saying. It doesn't change. Well, doesn't change. The, the slime molds are pleomorphic to begin with because they are like amoeboid in shape. So they're you no know, two alike. They're you know, like snowflakes. So where in the twee suite of uh, podcasts could we discuss 
um, slime molds. Twip. Oh, yeah. Maybe, no, it's not a parasite. It's not a parasite. Maybe it's Twivo. A, Twin. Twivo. Yeah, Twivo. Twin. Twin. It's Twin. a pro. It's a pro uh, <laughs> life form to multicellular organisms. They they aggregate, but they don't fuse and form organelles and things of this sort. But uh, almost. So it would be twin microbiology. Twin twin would be good. They're to amoeba, have. right? Yes. So that's they're correct. eukaryotes. So uh, that's right. That's exactly. I right. don't think they would go on. To, I guess they could go on to twin. Yeah. Why not? Or Twivo. It depends what you're looking at. Yeah. <laughs> Now, the authors anyway. make, the, make the statement here that pleomorphic virus particle morphology is a phenotypic trait. And infection by a single virus produces particles with the size distribution characteristic of a bulk infection. So, the, to me, that and you guys tell me if I'm right. That means if you could purify a single, say, filamentous flu particle and infect a cell with it, what you'd get out would be a range of... Spherical and filamentous, right? Yeah, I didn't really understand the <laughs> bit about a bulk infection, but I agree with what you just said. <laughs> but it can't be partial. Uh, 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 where? It so it doesn't breed true. Each size particle does not breed true when they infect a cell. That's what you're saying. I think it's a little they go confusing. Back to the original phenotype. So let me tell you about influenza viruses. Uh, Amy and I were looking at this paper by uh, Anise Lowen's lab this morning. So it's called spherical influenza viruses have a fitness advantage in embryonated eggs while filament producing strains are selected in vivo. So influenza has two morphologies, filament is spherical. We don't know what they mean, but she says filaments are generally observed in low passage, passage isolates. So if you get a nasopharyngeal isolate and you pass it in cells, those are mostly filamentous. But when you grow it in eggs, you lose the filamentous morphology. So, um, yeah, but she pulls out point mutations in PR and PR8, yeah. the matrix protein. So she then so that's passaged, genetically encoded. She passaged them in the in the other host, and yes, she gets uh, mutations that she thinks are associated with uh, filamentous versus spherical formation, which makes sense right. to me that there would be genetic control over this, right? But right, but they say we hypothesize that non-genetically encoded variable particle shapes. So I don't know how you can be encoded if you're non-genetic. Correct. So I don't, it that doesn't make- environmental influence. But that's, but you can't select for something that occurs stochastically. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. So this whole idea of non-genetic variable particle shapes to me is not correct. Yeah, I agree. Doesn't, I it's agree. scientifically not correct. Yeah. I, I, enables pleiotrophic to overcome selective pressures. You can't overcome a selective pressure if you occur by chance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's. So a, I have a question. I have a question about the filamentous particles. Yeah. I would assume that they have a greater internal capacity hmm. than, say, a spherical particle, and I'm wondering if they package more than one genome. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. And in flu, that's complicated because the genome is a multi-segmented thing. Yeah, yeah. Which I think right. of is, right. am I correct that, okay, so you have a number of segments, eight or nine segments, depending on the, mm -hmm. on the flu. My understanding is that uh, those actually come bundled, right? Yeah. Because yeah, they, they, they have a specific association with each other so that you can right. get selectively a complete genome in one particle. But nevertheless, right. it seems yeah. to me that a filamentous particle would have a uh, capacity for more than one bundle. Uh, like last week when we were talking about RSV and uh, came up with the notion that you can have up to nine genomes yeah. in a pleomorphic I, particle. I'm not clear why that would be. If you do the volume calculation, right, of length times depth times width or whatever it is, you learn, you know, so I can have a spherical particle with the same volume as I can have a, a filamentous particle. So therefore, why would I have bigger capacity? If volume is capacity, why would it be different? Well, that's well, a reason to the point. Is the volume the same though? Okay, yeah. That, uh, you can ask the question that way. If I look at uh, figure 1A in yeah, unfractionated yeah. wild type guys, I see some filaments that look to me as if they would have a capacity that yeah. was significantly greater than some of the spheres. I would agree. But they well, are. I um, also don't see where 
their individual filaments. Like at least the long one looks like there might be indiv- yeah. like you see the tr- like where it buds from like the Y shape. I would say that that might be five filaments together. Are you counting that as one? I mean aggregates. Yeah. Uh, I was counting that big long thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. That big long vertical thing as a filament. Yeah. No, it's multiple. It looks multiple, at least but it, it looks also like to uh, me like it's multiple particles. Like like end to end filaments. Yeah. It also exactly. looks like a lot of these filaments have a sphere at their end, right? <laughs> They do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if Almost they're looks just like a bacterial spore. I don't know like if they're attached to it or tetanus. fused. Anyway, I think it's a good question: the volume of a filament versus a sphere. It's, uh, but I don't know, Rich, if you put more RNA into filaments of flu. Anyway, I don't know. I'm not aware of that being looked it's, at. It's not really relevant to this paper. It just occurred to me yeah. as we were reading. So, so the, does the, all this have something to do with viral assembly? Once it's inside the cell and. All of a sudden, it starts to... You mean to, uh, what determines whether it's filamentous? Yeah, exactly, exactly. What, what produces the pleomorphism? I would assume that's part of it, right? There are, right, the, nu- the genome, the nuclear capsid has a protein on it, which can contribute to it. They, these viruses also, beneath the membrane, there's typically a, mem- a matrix protein of some kind. And sure. that you can imagine that could also influence... In fact, that's so, the change that uh, Anise Lowen picked up when she changed, when she shape shifted <laughs> influenza virus, shape shifting was that's um, great. was that's in the good was in the matrix <laughs> protein. So um, I can imagine it would be uh, yes, controlled par- at least partly by the the viral proteins for sure. So so the, in this article, the authors hypothesize that you know filamentous versus spherical depend on uh, some some external pressure. Uh, selective pressure, and they think that immunity might be one of them, right? And of course, viral glycoproteins we know are under selection pressure. We've, <laughs> even if you don't know much about viruses, you've heard about it in the past year. Um, and the, the influenza virus, hemagglutinin HA, is one. And then, of course, the Ebola virus, GP or glycoprotein, those are the two viruses being studied in this paper. And they ask, do, does pleomorphic shape influence the sensitivity of viruses to neutralization by antibodies? That's the fundamental question being addressed here. And then another pressure is the need to cleave the uh, glycoprotein, the spike glycoproteins of these viruses in order to get fusion. Uh, for HA, of course, it has to be cleaved to expose the fusion peptide at low pH. And... Um, so that's another requirement as well. And Ebola virus has to have its glycoprotein cleaved in the endosome uh, by endosomal proteases, and then it binds to a, a receptor in the endosome that triggers fusion. Um, so they're thinking um, maybe the shape has something to do with fusion as well. And that's what they look at here. Um, and the way they do it is quite interesting. The first part of the paper I understood very well. They use centrifugation to separate <laughs> filamentous and spherical particles of influenza virus, right? They, they call it particle size enrichment cycles of centrifugation at low centrifugal force with preferentially sediments filamentous particles. So they have a, a, uh, a pellet and a supernatant. And the pellet has most, they take pictures of it. The pellet has mostly filamentous particles and the supernatant has mostly spherical particles. Uh, so that's 47% filaments in the pellet and 5% filaments in the soup. You know, so it's a reasonable fractionation procedure. Um, and then they do their experiments with those. Um, and of course, there's a distribution of each one, but mostly their pellet. The pellet fraction is enriched in longer particles, and the supernatant is enriched in spherical particles. So the first question, do, do filaments have an infectivity advantage when they're put under selection with an antibody to the hemagglutinin? So they use two antibodies, two monoclonals. One um, prevents binding to cells, and that antibody binds at the top of the HA, the, at the receptor binding part. And the second antibody prevents uh, fusion, it binds to the base of the HA. It interferes with conformational changes that you need for fusion, but it doesn't interfere with receptor binding. So they can ask, 
the two different questions. You know, does antibody pressure at these two steps make a difference? All right. So what they're doing is uh, infecting cells and uh, looking for cell death in the presence of either antibody. It's a single cycle infection um, and uh, they're looking at cell death. And so they make sure they're adding similar amounts of virus particles to uh, the cells. Uh, with no antibodies, the pellet has no infectivity advantage over the supernatant, right? Putting same amounts of filaments and, and spherical particles. Um, but um, either antibody, uh, either the one that blocks attachment or the one that blocks fusion, has less of an effect on the pellet fraction than the supernatant. So, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's all about density, right? And it's the ratio of the target and the antibody, right? Right, right. So it's if you have a small surface area, you have three molecules, you have 100 antibody molecules, you can be neutralized. You have a large surface area, you have 1,000 molecules of HA, you have 100 neutralizing antibodies, and neutralization seems like you know <laughs> you could have figured this out without doing the experiment yeah i didn't need it. yeah i'm not clear <laughs> uh, exactly i'm not really clear what i uh, uh, why why this uh, uh, i'm a little um, yes yeah go on go well, on you have to you have to do <laughs> the experiment you so far you have right. to do the experiment i mean that's the whole it's reiterated in multiple different ways in this paper i mean just that observation what, I, what I'm fascinated with is that you infect with a spherical particle, but the product of that rep reproductive cycle in the cell produces all the pleomorphic forms again. And well, that's so, because it's not genetically encoded. <laughs> well, okay, so it must be <laughs> it must be part of the cell's configuration as to where in the cell the viral particle finally assembles. Don't you think? Well. It assembling in the same it, place all the time, isn't it? Yeah, but there are spatial differences even in this. If you go right down to the molecular level, you've got differences. But Of course, yeah. So what? I think actually, Dixon, the more ap applicable um, observation is anesis. So in, in, in natural infection, you get filamentous. Uh, Natural infection. It, well, the host. you know, in know an animal. Mean. In the, in in the, an animal. In the primary she gets, host. In the primary right. Host. She yeah. gets filamentous. And in tissue culture cells, she gets circular. So I think that it has more to do with um, growing cells on a static surface, like on a tissue culture dish. So you don't have, mm. you have more tension or something in the membrane and you are more shaped constrained than when you are in a tissue in a live organism. And you have more mobility and you have different surfaces and different things. So a tissue culture dish, you really have what, maybe three surfaces and you still maybe. have all that tension of binding yeah. to yeah. like that hard plastic. So could you so, uh, do the experiment in suspension cells to, to address that maybe? Or organoids. Organoids yeah. I don't like for various reasons, but that's a separate issue. Um, yeah, I mean, if yeah, because yeah, could do if, it in uh, suspension. Uh, what so, comes out of what comes out of chick embryos and embryonated eggs? Spherical. Yeah, spherical. If you pass it in eggs, and he says you get spherical. So that's a bird, but it's not the it's yeah, not that's the natural true. host bird. But it's still an ar it's it's an organism. It's still a, yeah, it's an organism. Yeah, yeah so oh, absolutely. Yeah. But I, think well, I didn't say my philosophy was foolproof. I just said I thought it, you know, but even in an egg, like in a non natural host, you have, you know, maybe you don't have all the right yeah. components at the right density. To Are make there bird it. cell lung lines or bird lung cell lines, rather? Uh, I don't know. I think it's hard. We, we used to. We used to make chick embryo fibroblast cultures, right, to do influenza virus, where you take an embryo and you chop it up and just, you know, trypsinize it and you get single cells. But I wasn't aware of any. There might be. Um, anyway. Uh, do people still do that, Vincent? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think, but I, I think. The so first year uh, high school biology Amy, are there, <laughs> um, do you know if there are avian organoid cultures? I guess there would be, right? There's no reason why there be. wouldn't be. There right? has to be, but yeah. I'm not sure. But to answer Rich's question, actually, they still do it. So 
before Steve's lab moved off the floor. Um, somebody here was interested in RSV and he has done it. Right. RSV. That's how you go Ross sarcoma virus. That's what Howard Temin originally did in Renato Dulbeco's lab. And, and you know, because they had just learned how to make cells in culture from chickens. Yeah. Cool. And, they, and they, the virus made foci. All right. So the next experiment, they say, all right, they want to know what's the mechanism. So they look at attachment of the particles to cells. And they, did, they use a fancy technique where they're actually looking at RNA in C2, single cell RNA in C2, but uh, without antibodies. And they're adding the same input of the pellet and the supernatant. You get the same number of genomes bound to the cell. So once again, there's no difference. You know, we saw already, there's no difference in cell killing between the soup and pellet. Now there's no difference in binding, okay? But if you add the antibody, if you add the blocking antibody, it has a greater effect on the supernatant than it does on the pellet fraction. And I, I know Amy is saying it's obvious because <laughs> it's more interface, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't know. So particle shape <laughs> modulates virus sensitivity to inhibition of either attachment or endosomal membrane fusion. Ah, because the, remember the fusion, they used both antibodies in that first experiment, the attachment and the, and the fusion inhibiting antibodies. So there you go. It's not just attachment, right? It's post-attachment as well. So, but that makes sense because in the endosome, the virus has to interface with the endosomal membrane to get fusion and the, the filamentous particles have somewhat of a better advantage to have more contact and so forth, right? So do all filamentous viruses also make spherical forms or is this an unusual filamentous virus? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, do, are there spherical forms of Ebola? They say, so in, they say so in this paper there that there are, yeah. And I was no. surprised because I always see pictures, you know, remember Fred Murphy yeah, they, showed us that picture? Sure. <laughs> the first picture he took of Ebola virus. He, yeah. Uh, but yes, they say in this paper that they do make spherical forms, yeah. And so influenza obviously does. We've been talking about it. Now, what would be interesting, there are filamentous bacteriophages, right? Like M13 is a filamentous, right? And I wonder if they go between filamentous and spherical. I don't know. Often. I don't think so because that's that, first of all, it's not a membraned particle. That's right. Uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, proteinaceous, and the capsid structure, if I'm not mistaken, is helical. Okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so uh, I think you can have various lengths of uh, of a filament, and that's why you can clone stuff into it because you can expand the capacity just by making a longer uh, helical capsid. But I think I think you're stuck with a helix as opposed to say an icosahedron okay. in that case. Okay. If somebody knows otherwise, let us know. But that, that's my understanding. Well, that's kind of related to the first statement that I that we were talking about, like that positive RNA viruses are generally like uh, icosahedrons. You know, they're proteinaceous. Mm. So even though flavies have an envelope, they have a icosahedral symmetry underneath the envelope. And so that's really my question of why like coronaviruses don't, you don't ever find them filamentous or elongated. They're mm. kind of smushy or oval spheres and stuff, but they're never filamentous. So what, why is it only negative? I don't know. Don't know. Good question. All right, moving onwards, we, then they say, okay, why are the filamentous particles resistant or more resistant to these antibodies? Are they actually resistant or are they decoys? So they're, they're decoying the antibodies and that gives some of the population an advantage. Okay, so they know that these particles, so this is an interesting aspect. The spherical, small spherical influenza particles attached to receptors and they're taken into the cell by clathrin mediated endocytosis uh, where a vesicle forms at the surface, it pinches off and then enters the endocytic pathway. The filaments are too big to get in that way. So they get in by macropinocytosis, which is a, a process where the 
the particle can bind the surface and then a piece of the cell membrane can wrap around it, pulls it in, and then it eventually joins the endocytic pathway for entry. And so they say, we're going to take advantage of this because we actually have an inhibitor of uh, macropenocytosis, a drug, <laughs> which is great to have these inhibitors, right? And so they say, let's do an experiment and see if uh, entry of these filamentous viruses are resistant to the drug or not. And in fact, uh, when they add this drug EIPA to the cultures, it reduces the infectivity advantage of the pellet compared with the supernatant in the presence of this antibody, because that's where you see the difference, right? So they say it's not just uh, decoy, it's actually specifically inhibiting um, the, the entry. You okay with that, Dixon? I'm absolutely okay. And I'm just trying to envision the other experiment, though, where you have an inhibitor of clathrin. Yeah. And then you should do that experiment, too, just to show that there is a difference. You could do it. Yeah, there are such inhibitors. I sure. know. I yeah. appreciate that. And, yeah. Um, yeah, very interesting. But they both end up in the same place, apparently. Yeah, they get into the endosome, yeah. And then, uh, Which is remarkable, considering how different their entry yeah, point is. Yeah. Why? Well, it's the same process, basically. Well, I guess it's just it? the part the part of getting past yeah, the you, plasma membrane. you make membrane. a ves uh, vesicle is being internalized. You know, we're we're focused on that. So the first step is different, but the rest of it is all the same. So are you getting effusion with lysosomes? No. I, I believe think you so. Do. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. You do. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. For I sure. mean these. Because these these want to get these viruses get out before the fusion, right? Otherwise, they get degraded. Yeah, sure, sure, so, sure. So right, if, but all you're saying, is, all we've done is basically uh, subdivide the way a large particle gets in versus a small particle. We've used two different words. That's true. So, but it is a different process because endocytosis, the particle sits on the membrane and, and the membrane invaginates, I guess. Whereas yes. macropinocytosis, is a little arm of the plasma membrane comes over and wraps itself right. around. Right, 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 right. I think right. it's, it's chemically it's still, a different it's process. It's still invaginated at the bottom. Eventually the it does, the yeah. And the base of the penotic, the macropenotic vesicle still yeah. invaginates. We've gotten confused about the details of how it closes at the top. Yeah, the grabbing, the initial grabbing is different. Right, because it's too it's too big yep. to yep. Yep. to go like this. So you have so actually it's probably not really grabbing. It's probably going like this and that makes us think that Maybe. it's grabbing because it's a larger distance to accommodate the so yeah, I don't I don't get it. Well, I think it's chemically different also. Uh, so that's why they're I'm not sure. Defined. I'm not All sure right. it's chemically. So different. um the next, they also want to. They want to further look at this decoy versus specific inhibition. So they they look at virus attachment um, on single cells. So they say uh, if uh, if it's a decoy, this should decrease the functional advantage of the pellet fraction. But if the filaments are actually resistant, uh, the frac the pellet should get additional advantage as the shorter particles in either mix uh, are taken off by this pressure first. Um, and so they do virus attachment studies, single cells, and quantify the percentage of cells. And they show basically that the pellet fraction shows a greater infectivity advantage with more inhibition. So these two together, they rule out the, um, the decoy theory. The filamentous are less sensitive compared with sphericals to inhibition of both attachment and membrane fusion. But Again, that makes sense, right? All right, so they want to look at the mechanism now. Why is the filamentous particle more resistant? And here they do an interesting experiment, single particle membrane fusion experiments. And they actually they put a dye into the viral particles, which uh, they can measure uh, the fluorescence of and when, when fusion occurs, uh, the fluorescence is quenched uh, as the dye moves through the membranes. And they're actually studying hemifusion, which is the fusion of the viral membrane with the outer mem viral membrane with the inner membrane of the, uh, well, the endosome. 
but these are planar membranes, I believe. These are artificial bilayers that they've made. But just one mem one one leaflet of the bilayer is fusing. That's what hemifusion is. And uh, they actually, I think this is a uh, this is a, a a detail, but I think it's mm -hmm. actually uh, the the dye is in the membrane mm -hmm. of the virus that they're asking that they're uh, adding. And it's a dequenching thing. I think the dye, when it's crowded, okay, okay. has less yeah. fluorescence and it goes than up. when it's more dilute. That's right. It's so when there's fusion happening, the dye is diluted out and it dequenches and you get an increase in fluorescence. Yeah, I think what it's on the next page. The figure's on the next yep. page. Figure, uh, figure four. And so uh, this is done is at this, low pH. Uh, yeah, it, go ahead. Is this artificial... Artificial membrane, is that a, uh, do, uh, is it a, actually a bilayer? That's yes, a, yeah, yeah. I was confused. I, I was, I was if confused it's a as is, to, yeah. <laughs> I was confused as to how they knew this was hemifusion <laughs> as opposed to complete fusion. Um, well, they are by, they call them planar membrane bilayers. Okay. Yeah, so the particle just, if you look at the figure, they're calling hemifusion where the particle is attached, but right. hasn't fused. Right. So the mm -hmm. membranes are not continuous. Right. You have the cell membrane or the bilayer, whatever. And then you have the viral, so they're separate entities. So you're at yeah. like the intermediate stage. So you've basically fused the outer leaflet of the... Uh, viral membrane bilayer with the upper leaflet of yeah, the right. thing, the planar bilayer that's right. that you're yeah. attaching it to. But what what's not clear to me is uh, why it stops at hemifusion and how you know that it's hemifusion. <clears throat> We've, I think you do it at temp different temperatures. I think you can probably do it at a different temperature. Yeah, so they say the hemifusion is, is a fusion intermediate detected by the onset of dequenching. Um, so maybe it's a timing thing as well, right? Either a timing thing or a pH thing before you hit a certain pH. Yeah. Now, I mean, uh, you can look at hemifusion in other ways, right? You can you could load the lipid bilayers with dyes and s see how they go in and whether they go in the bilayer or through it or not. But I don't think they're doing that here, so... I don't know exactly how they do it. So we'll take their word that it's hemifusion. Uh, the, the, what they do, though, is they look at hemifusion with time and they show that the pellet particles are less sensitive to HA inactivation compared with the supernatant. Um, and in the and in the absence of the monoclonal, the, the fusion efficiency is not limited by is not limited by particle size. But long particles fuse more rapidly compared with shorter particles. That's in the absence. In the presence of the monoclonal, uh, long particles fuse more efficiently than shorter particles. And this difference is greater at higher concentrations of the monoclonal antibody. So uh, uh, viral filaments fuse more rapidly at, at low HA pressures and more efficiently at high HA pressures than short particles. Well, again, yeah. same idea and surface area. Same idea. Just another right? way to look at it. They, they also asked, uh, can we quantify the binding of the antibody to the virus particles to get some insight? So they have a fluorescently labeled antibody uh, and they measure its binding to particles. And what they find, get ready for this, antibody binding scales with particle length. <laughs> I'm just joking because that that would be an obvious right? because the more the longer the particle, the more places there are for the antibody to, to bind. Yeah, you didn't see the eyes and the sarcasm. The long particles <laughs> escape the effects of antibodies rather than binding in itself, right? Because they're binding fine. It's just the effects of binding uh, are not realized there. Um, they and even if they add low pH to these particles, the antibody remains on, um, which uh, shows that the long particles um, tolerate levels of HA inactivation that inhibit the fusion of, of shorter particles. 
So their interpretation is that the, the, the greater tolerance of long particles to HA inactivation, and by that we mean the antibody, is that the greater number of HAs at the target interface, the contact patch afforded by these particles increases the total number of inserted HAs for a given amount of antibody bound. Um, Which begs the question of how many HAs do you actually really need? Yes, that's an interesting question. How many you need to get fusion, right? Yeah, I don't know. So um, these, so they're talking about fusion clusters, which is the, the number of HAs you need to get a fusion. Uh, so they make some mod they make some simulations of fusions uh, to try and get some kind of answer uh, about this. And they say at high H, the, the, the results of their modeling says at high HA activity levels, all these patches uh, have form fusion, uh, all, all, that, all of them have a high probability of assembling fusion cultures, but larger patches form them more rapidly, larger, which you would see in a filamentous particle as well. And larger patches require greater HA inactivation before there's any reduction in the fusion culture cluster yield. So again, they support the idea that filamentous particles fuse more rapidly or more efficiently in the, pres in the presence of inhibitors compared with shorter particles because they have more opportunities for HA insertion and fusion cluster formation. Okay, makes sense. It's kind of intuitive. The next set of experiments are interesting. Um, so these long filaments are resistant, somewhat resistant to an activation of HA, but how resistant are they actually? Um, so they do this experimentally by, so they make, they, they inactivate the HA experimentally by uh, making uh, HA and the particles that are resistant, 100% resistant to cleavage. Right, so you can't cleave these, the cleavage site has been changed. And now they say, can the filamentous particles still infect cells even if they can't cleave the HA, even if the HA can't be cleaved, right? So they do, they say, they say we did a modified plaque assay. So immediately I, I, my eyes opened up and I went to see what this modified plaque assay was. And it's basically you infect the cells with these viruses in the absence of trypsin for I don't know, four or five hours to allow the virus to attach and get in. And then you add overlay with trypsin so that the subsequent cycles, when the virus comes out of those first infected cells, they will be cleaved. So they'll make a plaque and you can score it. Otherwise, they can't infect, right? And so when you do that, um, about 5% of the pellet particles can still infect cells even though the HA can't be cleaved. All right, so normally if you can't cleave HA, you can't infect, but these filamentous particles are so efficient at being able to attach that they can get in without uh, the HA being cleaved. I guess there's a wonderful big surface area between the virus and the membrane, and this is overcoming the need to, uh, to uh, cleave the HA, which is needed to flip out the fusion peptide. What did you say, Amy? You thought maybe that they're, they're really good at pulling the membranes together, right? Yeah, I think that the more HA that's inserted into uh, the target, the, pro the higher the percentage that the membranes will be so close enough that uh, because they're both cell membrane derived, that mm -hmm. they will just fuse because that's what lipid membranes do. That's the biophysical properties of membranes. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I think all of this just demonstrates that a larger surface area allow, you know, you can have um, more, more HA in and then you're resistant to lots of things that when you have a small surface area and you have less density of the, or you have less number of molecules, then yeah. you really, you're more sensitive. There must be a so, cost. Right, there must be right. a cost because but, no, you, otherwise you would say all oh, virus, all well, the viruses who can would be filamentous, right? <laughs> if it's so good. Well, it's unclear to me that in natural, in their natural environment, 
that they aren't all filamentous and that this spherical thing is an artifact of our need to mm. do experiments. Yeah. And <coughs> you mean you're saying it's a spherical and... aberration? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if whether or not this whole thing is just, you know, we, we characterized an artifact of tissue cult of viruses that are produced in tissue culture. Wouldn't cells be, wouldn't be, the, wouldn't, be the, wouldn't be the first time, right? Right. And <laughs> right. So, I mean, in our discussion earlier, like, I'm not all that happy with um, the way the, like, the fact that, like, Anise Lowen's mutations weren't looked at in, in the context of mm. these. Because, as I said earlier, something that's stochastic doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't conform to selective pressure. So, I don't know what they're talking about when they say, you know, this is a way to overcome selective pressure. No, you just make 600,000 particles. And by definition, 300 of them are, are going to be filamentous. And that's enough to launch an infection. Yeah. So I don't know. But Rich is really quiet. So maybe he disagrees. I uh, know. Uh, well, I'll tell you, there's two things going on here <laughs> uh, you know, uh, in Austin, Texas. Uh, oh. <laughs> one is that I'm just thinking, Jenna, first of all, uh, Amy, I appreciate your um, uh, your sort of uh, pointing out that a lot of this is obvious. I was sucked into their uh, whole thing about you know going through the rigor of this, but uh, in fact, there's a lot of it that does seem pretty obvious. I would say that there are a lot of mm, phenomena in nature that we kind of uh, seem like it ought to be obvious, uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, you still need to do the experiment. Yep. Um, the uh, uh, to me, the bottom line is that there. Uh, it does point out that there is an advantage. It it appears. Yeah. To being filamentous. I mean, maybe it's an obvious advantage, but here's the experiment that suggests there's an advantage. Uh, and then, while one of the reasons I've been quiet is that I've been reviewing the pox virus literature <laughs> on uh, fusion because we went through this whole thing of hemi fusion. With mm. pox viruses, mm. the pox virus ent entry process is extraordinarily complex. We're talking sixteen proteins. Okay, you need four proteins for attachment, and that's a completely separate process from fusion, which involves a an uh, a complex of proteins that contains twelve different proteins. Okay. Uh, and we don't really understand how they work all together, but some of them, if you knock out uh, if you knock out some of them, you actually arrest the fusion process at hemifusion. Okay, so you have a particle sitting on the outside of the cell with uh, with the membrane hemifused, and it stops there. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's so, cold. I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's sort of my historic uh, ex experience with it. It's kind of interesting, actually. I hope that. Well, when you guys do your pox only or solo twist with the guy who generated the monkey pox virus, maybe you need to have two well, uh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and discuss all the nuances. But the virus is enormous, if I remember correctly. It's oh, like, yeah. you know, so yeah. it, I mean, it's like 11 times the size of these things or mm. something. It's big. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and it also has a, broad host range. Hmm. Uh, so I, I think, uh, and I kind of, in my mind, I sort of equate this uh, elaborate machine for entry. And by the way, the attachment proteins are in the long run, fairly nonspecific. You can't point to a receptor. Okay. Well, maybe There's that's a bunch, why. Of, bunch of different cell surface molecules that'll work. Uh, <laughs> and you don't necessarily need all four. All right, so that that gives you a fairly broad host range, and maybe because and now I'm really winging it here, maybe because of that, if you want to get into a broad range of cells, you better have a pretty elaborate machine uh, yeah, to get probably. through. Yeah, but Makes these sense. are very specific; they're very yeah. narrow and very yeah. specific, and you know, um, I mean, it might even have been more interesting to have looked at you know, avian flu, which sometimes spills over, but never mm. establishes itself in human populations versus H1N1, which, you know, has 
really adapted to the humans or whatever. Um, I'm not arguing that you shouldn't do the experiments because it's obvious. Um, that's not really my argument. I'm just, it's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just not surprised at the findings. Like the right. findings seem sure. to me very simple math and, you know, this is what we, we did, you know, in, you know, when I took geometry or whatever, you know, and it kind of, you know, I mean, I think like the first figure it, that you think is this long filament is filamentous particles back to back to give this that observation. But it's one plane of an EM. Like maybe if you did confocal microscopy, mm. we would be able to answer that question. I don't really well, know. Well, you know, uh, not being a kind of a, uh, not being a flu guy, I have to say that when I think of flu, I don't think of it as a filament. Yeah. I will now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. But uh, I'm used to sort of the laboratory defined flu. Yeah, for sure. And I think of it as uh, more spherical. I think of the filaments as an aberration. Okay. But it uh, sounds like that's not the case. Well, you know, the classic EM of influenza virus is this spherical particle, right? Taken years ago because they yeah. propagated in cell culture, right? Sure. And that kind of what yeah. sticks in our head, but yeah. I also wonder uh, to some extent about the extent of pleomorphism in some other particles, like for example, coronaviruses, because after all, mm. you're plunking these things down on an EM grid and taking them through a series of dehydration steps and et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so you're subjecting them to a number of different forces. Uh, I'd like to see, uh, I guess you'd have to do this with a cryo EM or something like yeah, that. It's a little weird. You're freezing them in water too. That's, you know, you could argue that's doing weird things as well, right? But I think it's probably less traumatic than uh, yeah. <laughs> negative staining, right? Yeah. Right. But if you're freezing in water, and it's yeah. a random population. Yeah. Then you should be able to find all of the intermediates. It's yeah. you know not equal percentage, but at some stage. But and yeah. But so people, once again, like I'm not really clear, you know, why that one is some morph of spherical, or at least we think it's morph of spherical. And these are, you know, so very different. Like most, spherical is very different from, you know, long and slender. Most of these cryos are done with cell culture propagated virus, I think, to get higher concentrations, right? So it would be hard to do with a clinical specimen. Well, the clinical specimen from corona, from SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. They took they're, foul they're, off of yeah, the they person did. And, there's a picture. and put it directly into their little microscope pushed some button and some picture arrived yeah it looks they were Plus like four <laughs> there were like four or five particles in that picture right and they all look more right. or less the same size yeah right. right right out of the person's lung yeah so as long as we're talking about um you know the sort of impact of experimental technique on what what you see i have to relate a little mm -hmm. personal story here of um uh, during a phase of my life when we were trying to understand a little more about pox virus morphology. And in fact, you know what comes to mind is sitting at my desk in my office with Mavis across from me. Yeah. <laughs> talking to Mavis. What a blast. Cool. Okay. Well, who else would you talk to? Yeah. So <laughs> pox viruses are brick shaped. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and it turns out that it's very difficult to get a good measure of the thickness of the brick from a whole mount micrograph. That is where you're just dropping virus onto mm -hmm. the grid because when the virus sits down, it, it doesn't, it very seldom sits on the edge. It flops over. And to me, it just, it just seemed like, God, it's so small. Hmm. Okay. It, does it really flop over? <laughs> <laughs> it just didn't seem right. That's and Mavis funny. said, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, it flops over. Sure. Well, I mean, if you put it, if you go with a pipette and you come here from the top and you pipette one droplet, it flops over. Hmm. Yeah. I just don't think somehow I, 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 I figured somehow in my naive mind, I figured that something so small would defy gravity. Okay. And that, and that it wouldn't flop over, but that's not the case. Hmm. It flops over. So does influenza virus bud out of the cell or does it explode after it kills the cell? No, it buds. It buds out. 
Buds out. Buds out. Okay, yeah. so if you did a timed experiment of single cells with single virus particles, wouldn't it be interesting to see whether or not the first virus out of the cells were either filamentous or, or spherical? Is there a sequence of shedding that uh, favors the small first and then the next smallest and then the next smallest and finally the big ones come out? I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, if you're doing it in cell culture, you may get all spherical out, right? Maybe because that's it's selecting. Yeah. I don't know. But, uh, I don't know. It's an interesting question. I don't know. But if you were to take the analogy that it's like, let's say something simple, like a pastry bag and a tip and you squeeze from the back of the pastry bag or the back of your toothpaste thing and you go through all of your droplets until you start to really like get to the bottom of the <laughs> toothpaste tube. You, got a squirt coming out. <laughs> you get a big one. That's it. That's the answer. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Okay. Fine. Cell, when the cells. Actually, <laughs> India. I, don't, I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> yep. Amy, I like your idea of the constraints imposed by a cell culture. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah, yeah. really hold up if you think about the chick embryo, but maybe there's something else going on there. And I think that it would be interesting to, uh, you know, investigate uh, the factors. That, yeah. And this has probably been done to some extent. I'm just not aware of it. The factors that influence whether you get sure. predominantly spherical or predominantly filamentous particles out the other end. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how much, um, you know, I don't know enough about the constraints like of Snooks cultures because Snooks are clearly constrained because they're in matri gel. They're embedded uh, in matri gel. Are, are oh, so Snook is a, a, a long biologist here at Columbia who has generated really elegant uh, proximal distal organ, lung organoids. And, but they're embedded in matri gel so that they have some kind of 3D shape because otherwise you don't have the right um, morphogens and polarization to yeah. give you the proximal distal stuff. But right. if you think about your respiratory tract, you're in a negative, you're in a like free for all because you're in a negative chamber that then pulls in the air and then you know, you release the negative pressure to exhale. So you're actually kind of like in a free for all, like the way the lungs are. And so what, what that does to viral particle shape is not really clear to me. What survives in nature? Yeah, it does. But uh, so in nature, I think, when the virus, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to ask about survivability out of the host. Is there a differential survivability between spherical and uh, filamentous? Good question. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Good question. Or transmissibility, right? Yeah. Correct. That's what I'm driving at. How's, uh, exactly right. uh, how's fluid right. transmitted? Are we talking droplets here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, here we are. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know if it's been And it's at. columnar epithelium, right? It's ciliated columnar yeah. epithelium that they infect. So yep. those are bipolar cells. There's no question about it. Yeah. Or a distal probe, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, so. Rich, you were talking about how thick the um, pox virus is, and it just made me realize why Ian Anderson <laughs> called his album Thick as a Brick. <laughs> <laughs> he was a pox virologist in disguise? I guess so. I guess so. The guy, I don't know, you, you've probably heard of that album, right? No, I haven't. I've been, I've been uh, out of the uh, music conversation oh, that's in this old, episode, though. I have to confess. That's old. That's old. All right. Um, one more experiment. And this, you may be wondering, where is Ebola virus? Okay, here it is. <laughs> so they, this is probably why Kartik is on the paper, right? Because they made influenza viruses with the glycoprotein from Ebola virus, right? Pseudotypes. I don't know. This guy, the last author collaborates a lot with Kartik. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there have been they, multiple They probably papers. said make the pseudotype, or probably they had it already. And so... Apparently, when you put the Ebola glycoprotein onto influenza virus, you get short particles and you get long particles that you can fractionate by centrifugation. So they do the same experiments as they've done here before for flu, and they find the pellet, the filaments enter cells more efficiently, even when you add antibody pressure. Um, 
the pellet, the filamentous viruses have greater tolerance to fusion inhibition using an antibody that blocks that. So they say um, lo the low sensitivity of filamentous particles to conditions that limit fusion glycoprotein activity is a general property of pleomorphic viruses. Well, I don't know if, if two makes it general, right? But it's more than one, right? More like a private. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a general. That's right. It's not even a light kernel. Oh, this boy. This is exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> So well, that, I'll, you know, I'll, I, put, I, I'll put my money on that. That's okay. I had another question about the length of the filamentous virus particle. Um, when they do produce them, are they variable in length or are they all the same length? I think they're variable, They're right? variable, yeah. So they're it variable. sounds like some process inside the cell is either allowing it to elongate or it's truncating them back into spherical forms, depending on which comes first, the spherical or the, yeah. or the filamentous. So... It sounds like a molecular ecology problem. That's that's the way I would state that. You know, it's it's an ecology. interesting point. In fact, you know, there are many experiments that you can do. First of all, um, you can produce just the HA protein in cells right. with no other viral protein, and it will make particles. And I wonder mm -hmm. mm. if you ever get filamentous or if they're always spherical because HA alone is not right. enough to give you, right. maybe you need to have the matrix or something else, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the other as aspect is that the, um, the escort machinery of the cell, which is involved in membrane scission, is involved in mm. budding. And I wonder if that contributes to uh, filamentous mm. versus spherical. There's a lot of interesting things you could do but here. But then if that is true, the escort machinery should be it, then it's involved in HIV budding. Yeah, yeah. It's involved you don't in see, you, again, you don't see filamentous HIV. No, You see Never. some degree of spherical, oval, blah, 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 but you don't see filamentous. No, right. you don't. You don't see it. So and the first thing that comes to mind as I think about that is that HIV has a, has a capsid inside that mm -hmm. probably influences the that's true, ultimate yeah. shape of yeah, the thing. That's right. It does have a capsule. Could be, yeah. but, you know. Yep, yep. Anyway, a lot so of if questions. You sonicate, if you sonicate the filamentous pellet, <laughs> will you get spherical viral particles from it? Or will any of them be infectious? That's a good question. After they've all rounded up because you've forced it to by sonication? That's a good question. Well, if you break I, apart the filaments... <laughs> Aren't you going to break apart by sonication? Aren't you going to break apart all of the genome maybe. and not have the appropriate number of genome well, segments maybe in not. that part? Maybe one little, maybe one little round one got everything, and another <laughs> one didn't get anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm just speculating here. Anyway, if Rich can say these things like this, so can I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm willing I'm to agitate it, Dixon. Uh, no, not. come on. <laughs> I, uh, I think that if you listen back through the last hour, there's at least a grant. Here, <laughs> well, I don't want to so write any questions. I would. Say. No, I don't want to write it either. <laughs> I'm not writing. No. But the other uh, thing is, but, is yeah, you're traditionally right. is. when I think of filamentous particles, I also think of paramyxos, like measles. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But they're, in the end of their paper, though, they're saying that there's some evolutionary advantage to producing both types because one is a non-specific infector of cells and the other one is extremely specific and in various situations either one can work so that has a lot of um, cachet yeah. from an evolutionary standpoint well, that's their that's their not, not necessarily cachet for the grant by the way rich that's their <laughs> hypothesis that's they're hypothesizing that yeah 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 i'm saying you know being yeah, filamentous but they also say that they are adapted to host host specific conditions yeah, you yeah, yeah, started yeah. off with this is a non-genetic you're right thing you're not adapted to anything yeah i mean the idea that if you have some pressure on the ha or whatever glycoprotein it can be partially overcome by a filamentous morphology it makes sense but i don't know how it's controlled right right well, I don't think it is controlled. As I said at the beginning, I think yeah, it looks you, random. It looks right. Random. I think if you spew out a thousand particles, right. one will be of the appropriate shape. Yeah. Which then comes to my problem with this idea that they're not necessarily decoys because we would consider 
the thousand, the 999 other particles that were not infectious, defective interfering particles. Mm -hmm. And they are considered decoys. Mm -hmm. Yes, true. So I just, I just wonder what if in your lung, if you have influenza, what's being made? Is it all a filamentous? But are makes, there EMs of this? There has to be. Yeah. There's got to be exactly. Well, right. I think clinical. How if about, you take nasopharyngeal wash, <laughs> it's mostly filamentous, and then you start growing it, it in cells, it becomes spherical. So I think we're making filamentous uh, influenza virus, and that's why you sneeze because it's tickling your nose. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> I, I didn't get the sneeze. <laughs> but part. you should shut your window because influenza. Because you have all these filaments <laughs> right? in your nose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. I got it. But so the idea of, uh, I think they're there. And I'm not sure there's this trade off between spherical and filamentous in, in the host because I think they're all filamentous, at least for flu. I don't know about the other viruses. So that, that's my feeling. So all this idea that it's normally s spherical and then there's pressure, so you become filamentous, I don't buy that at all, right? which is what they're thinking about. Which is basically the nice way of me say, of you saying what I said initially was, I thought that in part this was the artifact of subculture. I think it is. And uh, I think the findings are interesting, uh, but I think it made us think more along lines of, yeah, what's happening in cell culture is very different in terms of the morphology of many viruses, not all, but many. But that's, right. you know. So it's telling you more about the cell than it is about the virus. Well, I don't know. No, Did I learn sure about anything that. about the cell? I mean, I don't know what, I don't know anything more about well, the virus. Well, the virus can't do off. anything on its own. Yeah. The virus can't do anything by itself. It but needs no, the cell. I think so if the that, cell conditions. I think it's an interesting question. How does the cell participate in, you know, how does it, how does this filament come out versus a, a, you know, the filaments Correct. come exactly. out perpendicular exactly. to the cell. So what's controlling whether- and it's not genetic. I have no idea. I'm not sure it's, it's well, knowable. Well, maybe it's like philopodia or lamapodia when you're yeah, going to maybe. walk with yeah, actin. actin. In science, comes out. Amy, there is no maybe. Well, I didn't do, this There's isn't no my field of expertise. <laughs> and this is not my field of expertise, no. nor is it my next grant application. My next grant application <laughs> is completely different. Me neither, but when you <laughs> so raise sure these kinds of questions, something. though, these are fundamental. These are yeah, fundamental are. questions about how cells and viruses interact, right? Yep. It still has meaning. Oh, you want a fun fundamental biology? <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> well, somebody enough. has to pay for the experiments. Although I have served on an NIH study section. This is all true. This is all um, true. Otherwise. But, I mean, yeah. what could you learn by, what, what, what would you learn, Vincent, if you did discover that there was some trait of the cell where the virus was actually produced, which if it's in this configuration, you get a sphere. If it's in this configuration, you get a filament. I mean, I think it, has to do with how the viral well, proteins to be the case. how the viral proteins interact with the escort machinery because it's the escort machinery that pinches yes. off the yes. bud, right? I and would agree with that. So if it's very long, it means it's not getting pinched off early on. And why is that? It must right. have something to do with it. The other interesting aspect of this is that not all viruses bud from the plasma membrane. Many bud from internal membranes. And are those ever filamentous, or is that a a physical uh, restriction yeah. or not? I don't know the answer. I'm just raising right. more more questions so, here. And, but and but finally, Jason, if you could figure out, go ahead. In our opening statement, we said that even if it's spherical or, or long or filamentous, it's probably each got a single genome. Is that really true? No, well, we don't I know. know. I don't know. That's a good question. I like how you put it as an opening statement. This is a trial, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> In our opening salvo, <laughs> Amy, well, what were you going to we'll say? Get some, uh, maybe because we'll get some uh, new content in our mailbag. Yeah, we'll see. As, uh, as but, a result of Go ahead, this. Amy. Dixon, if you could figure out how you, if you said it was a cell thing yeah. yep. that was dictating, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And potentially, yeah. if you, and you said, okay, everything that comes out of nature is filamentous, but it, I, if I do this, I can skew it to spherical, which isn't yeah. so good. So then you would make an antiviral 
that then you would, or you would make a target, a drug target or whatever, target a drug towards skewing it to being more of the spherical. So it wouldn't be as, right. tr- you there know, you infectious you or yeah. whatever. There you go. But that's a, you know, that's a pie in the sky dream that's in my head somewhere. Like, you know. <laughs> Do you read the last line of their um I did. I did. <laughs> because they they claim of of observing all of these uh, phenomena that they now have um, insight into how to create Ebola virus vaccines. And I <laughs> did not follow that at all. Uh, they were yeah. flipping out in the discussion. It yeah, doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, th- this is a highly reviewed uh, journal and the reviewers should have stopped it somewhere. Because that misled me to thinking, perhaps I didn't see one of the figures or I, I missed an entire page worth because my printer wasn't working or something. But it's not true. Well, it's, it's a whole there's nother. nothing in there that says that you, now that we know this, we can do that. Wait, I don't see the word vaccine. I see the word antiviral treatment, meaning well, like an antiviral drug. But I don't see the too. word vaccine. But you're still going to be, well, let's therapy, therapy. Right. That's what I'm driving at. So. Well, yeah, but maybe like what I just said would that's what they were thinking. But, you know, you mean stop I'm not, all the filamentous and get the spiracles to come out and you're OK. That doesn't yeah. happen at Ebola, I don't think. Well, I don't know. Uh, the but they use the, the word Ebola. Is, they use the word Ebola. Yeah, they I know. The and they influenza. use NIPA and Hanta and all <laughs> yeah. the big, highly super pathogenic viruses that we're all afraid of because, you know, they're like. The boogie monster coming button? out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're, the boogie monster coming out of your closet. But when I said it, it was some amorphic cloud in my brain that hadn't been fully developed. Was that amorphic uh, filamentous or pleomorphic? Was it Is that pleomorphic, Amy? <laughs> Pleo. Yes, it was pleomorphic. Can you talk Maybe about multicolored? Uh, can thoughts can thoughts or ideas be pleomorphic? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you been listening? <laughs> well, usually they're either ill-defined or ill-developed or amorphic. Yeah, no, well, that is pleomorphic. Okay. <laughs> it's nebulous. How All right, nebulous let's, do some, uh, let's do some email. Rich, can you take that first one, that please? better. Carson writes, hi, Twivers and Daniel. I'm sending this to both emails because I'm not sure who could better answer these questions. One, I know research shows that long-term vaccine side effects generally start within two months of vaccination. Personally, I'm very comfortable with the safety of the COVID vaccines and am thankful to be fully vaccinated with Moderna. However, I wonder if the argument could be made that something like cancer wouldn't be seen for years. I know that in general, carcinogenicity can be difficult to determine, especially for things that everyone is exposed to. I don't think that anything points to the COVID vaccines being carcinogenic, but how would we be sure? Is it enough uh, they're not carcinogenic in vitro or in mouse models? It just seems like anything greater than a year or so out would be really difficult to link back to the vaccine in the first place, even if it did cause it. Again, I'm confident in the safety of the vaccines, but these questions still nag at me. Two, with regard to the clotting disorder that is possibly linked to the AstraZeneca vaccine, just for clarity, when you say that the rate of this is no higher than in the general population, do you mean that you'd expect in the same number of cases of that specific clotting disorder in the same time period from non-vaccinees. Also, if it were not related to the AstraZeneca vaccine, wouldn't we be picking up the same thing with other COVID vaccines? Given that there seems to uh, seems to predominantly impact on women between 20 and 50, I'm interested in how many of the patients uh, are on hormonal birth control I myself am 25 and take a combination of birth control pills, which I know can increase the risk risk of blood clots, though I don't know if they would be the same type of clot. I don't want people to be afraid of vaccines or birth control as both are life-saving, but I'm curious nevertheless. Thanks for all you do, Carson. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, long-term side effects of the vaccine. Uh, I, you know, my... My opinion is that all I can, all we can really say is that in the history of vaccines, we have not seen long-term effects uh, that arise, that arise uh, much later 
than in that first, say, six week uh, period. Uh, you know, I, as as scientists, uh, as a scientist, I can't say it can't happen. Okay, uh, I can't imagine a mechanism by which these um, uh, vaccines that we're talking about would induce uh, something like cancer. Uh, I think it uh, highly unlikely, but I'm not going to say it can't happen. Um, and I think that uh, it's the kind of thing that, you know, think about the uh, association between, uh, you're right, that if it's something that takes uh, 20 years to show up, that uh, tracking it back to the vaccine, in particular, if the whole population has been vaccinated, uh, would be very difficult uh, unless it tracks to, say, one specific vaccine type or or another. Um, I, what comes to mind is the association between uh, cigarettes and um, uh, and and cancer. It took a long time to sort out and a lot of uh, epidemiology. Um, so I think it unlikely, but I'm not going to say it can't happen. Anybody want to weigh in on that? Well, I was thinking about the association at one point of what was it, IPV and SV and SV40 well, and cancer. Yeah. Well, the and, early batches and, of IPV having yeah. SV40, yeah. Um, but so I'm a little confused about uh, how we define carcinogenic. So none of these things damage or alter your genome. Right. And so like an AIMS test, that is where you look at a mutagen and stop. So these aren't altering your genome. So I'm not clear why they would be, why anybody would associate them with car, with uh, carcinogenesis. Uh, like I said, I can't think, of, I can't think of yeah, a mechanism. Yeah. So, but it is, it's possible. the IPV came to mind. It's it's possible to imagine how it might induce autoimmunity, however, if the antigen that you were immunizing against uh, resembled even remotely some tissue uh, component that later on got magnified because the vaccine was still producing protein or whatever else uh, the vaccine was based on. How long would that take, that though? You could, but I don't, I don't know if that's ever been even looked at. Well, actually, that's a good segue into the second question about the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, and don't forget to add J&J into that. Yep. Uh, it's just just uh, today. That's uh, right. I, uh, we, we all read in the New York Times um, an article saying that in the U.S. they were putting a pause on Seven vaccination people, with J&J &J yeah. because of a possible association with clotting much the same as in AstraZeneca. My understanding, my, my understanding currently of the sort of the best guess uh, about the mechanism of these clotting disorders is that it is in fact, or at least one, one model or set of data says that uh, it is in fact an autoimmune um, situation where somewhere on the order of uh, 10 days or so after the immunization, autoantibodies uh, are present that interact with a a cytokine, a protein involved in uh, signaling in uh, clotting uh, and uh, uh, dysregulate the clotting reaction to result in uh, thrombosis. Right. Um, and uh, right. now, sure. Uh, and so uh, these, the, the questions here are uh, entirely appropriate because that yeah, the initial, the initial um, spin on this, which is, you know, still appropriate is that if you look at the entire population, the rate of uh, these clotting disorders is no higher than the background rate of clotting disorders in the population. Okay. So from that point of view, um, the vaccine does not uh, impose an increased risk. However, if you have a closer look, you may find uh, it, the, the way it's, it, it's shaping up to me is that, first of all, uh, this particular clotting order, uh, the, the signal for this particular type of clotting uh, disorder is uh, maybe higher than background. And in particular, maybe higher than background if you take into consideration that it seems to be occurring in younger females. That's the way yes, uh, I yes, understand that's it. That's, right, that's right. Um, and so uh, from that point of view, 
uh, you may be able to identify a subpopulation of individuals that is at higher risk for uh, this particular uh, mm -hmm. clotting disorder. So uh, that's good news and bad news. The bad news is that it mm, uh, has a tendency to uh, support the notion that maybe this is in fact vaccine induced, that the vaccine is doing it. That's the bad news. The good news is that uh, knowing that it's, uh, it may be restricted to a certain subpopulation of uh, individuals and knowing something about pathogenesis of the disease, uh, you may be able to modify how the vaccine is uh, administered or to whom it's administered uh, right. to uh, uh, accommodate these problems. And uh, I, uh, at the tail end of this wrap, I just want to say one thing because it's, uh, I, I've had to deal with uh, uh, trying to reassure people about these vaccines uh, in in the face of this kind of thing. And it's real easy to say, oh, well, the overall risk of uh, clotting is no greater than uh, in the general population. And, uh, you know, there's a much greater risk that you're gonna throw a clot flying in an airplane uh, than doing this. And, oh yeah, well, clotting is a risk factor uh, for taking hormones and blah, 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 blah. But for the people who throw the clots and die, that's all irrelevant. Okay. So I want to, I want to point out that I'm not insensitive. We are not insensitive. Nobody is insensitive to the fact that no matter what the statistics are, if you're the victim, it's a hundred percent. Okay. Uh, and so this, this, this deserves some attention. Yeah, rare though it might be. And it's a treatable um, condition if you can recognize it early on. Uh, I think so. Not if yes, it's in your not if it's least. in your brain, right? And you no, stroke. No, of course yeah. not. If you get an embolism there, it's not so. Uh, so good. The, the Rich the Carson says, shouldn't we be seeing this in the other vaccines if it's just a general population level thing? Right. That's a good mm. point. Well, that's why the uh the the news of J and J sort of threw me for a loop today because. Uh, previously, uh, we've been trying to understand how this might be specific for the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, which is chimp adenovirus vectored and has another difference from the J&J &J vaccine, which is that it does not, and the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines in that the spike protein is not prefusion stabilized. There are some other differences and there may be, I'm sure there are other differences that uh, I'm not aware of, but if J and J now is doing the same thing, mm. then you can't pin it on whether or not it's a prefusion stabilized uh, S protein because the J and J vaccine has the prefusion stabilized S protein, as do the mRNA vaccines. Um, and uh, then it comes down to comparing: uh, is there some common antigen or epitope in the chimp adeno and the uh, AD26, the human adenovirus? That might trigger an autoimmune response. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Well, uh, but, there has to be something about adenovirus vectors because uh, they were very controversial for gene therapy, and you saw tons of complications. And I believe clotting was one of them. Yeah. And they've uh, been used, you know. So I don't know. All, when Vincent and I talked about this this morning, my first said, I, my first response was, "It's the ad virus. It's the ad virus. It's the ad virus vector." Well, it's, uh, it, 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 if that's the case, it's something that both the chimp adenovirus and the AD26 have in common. And we and should... I don't, uh, I, don't, I don't know how related they are. I mean, well, I'm sure like that eventually we'll hear about it yeah. from the Chinese version of the AD vector and from Sputnik. Yep. But, well, hopefully. you know, <laughs> Russia isn't report... Like I read this article, I think, in the journal or the Times about like how Russia has not rep right, reported the right numbers of cases and stuff. So I wouldn't be surprised not to find out. And China only just now announced after, you know, the president of, of Argentina was vaccinated and came down COVID positive that their actual inactivated vaccine had like a blip above 50% efficacy or something or other. I don't have all the numbers yep, or all that's the details, correct. That's but correct. something about that. Right. Yep. So 
for us not to find out that these other adenovirus vectored vaccines have any of these complications for the next year and a half, I wouldn't be surprised. But then I wouldn't be surprised to find out that they actually did. So, Rich, the other uh, the other question that Carson asks is about birth control pills, yeah. and I don't know that we have all the data on that uh, Talk to uh, at Daniel. this point. Yeah, Daniel, yeah, uh, well, Daniel might know. I'm sure, uh, but I'm sure that this is the kind of thing they're looking at. I'm sure he'll. Uh, talk about it uh, Thursday. How many, I know about over 55 million AstraZeneca doses have been given out. How many J&J do you know offhand, uh, Rich? Uh, no, I don't know offhand. I, I did some math this morning uh, and I even forget, uh, which is because I think there were some numbers in the New York Times article and I came out with a an incidence of something like uh, one in 150,000 Mm -hmm. uh, vaccinations and uh, that that's sort of the the um highest probability i mean it depends on what demographic you look at what vaccine blah 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 you, i've seen you know uh, numbers ranging anywhere from one in a million of these kind of complications oh i know what i was looking at i was looking at the uh the data now from astrazeneca in the uk uh because you know for a while they were saying oh well this is not happening in the uk now I think they've had a closer look. They say, oh, yeah, there are some uh, clotting cases of, of this type. And as I recall, that incidence was on the order of one in 100,000, uh, one in 150,000 uh, recipients. So, But I like how she says that she takes birth control. She's well aware of the increased risks of clots because estrogen is a clotter. And I have a friend whose mother took hormonal treatment during menopause through a clot and actually missed her daughter's wedding because she had to have her kidney and one of her lung partial parts of her lungs removed because she had clots there. Yes. Um, and I think that that increase that risk of clotting is pretty high. Um, and that's acceptable. Yeah. But having, Oh, you know, However you want to dice the numbers for this vaccine, I'm not sure that they're even close to that range. That's no, unacceptable. They're not. No, they're not. So I'm I'm not really clear about the logic or yeah, what uh, is acceptable and not acceptable. So I, I'm a little... It's probably whatever you get used to. Yeah. Well, what? yeah. So I'm a little confused or... I, I don't know how really to respond or to react, I guess. Well, risk versus benefit. Uh, when so, you take a birth control pill, you're trying to prevent a pregnancy. So that's a pretty serious deal for some people because they don't want to have children. Right, but so I'm they're willing to, to risk dad. the clots. They're willing to risk the clots. In this case, um, you're trying to stay out of the hospital. Or dead. Or dead. Or dead, you know, both. I mean, both of those things, right? Or prevent long-term sequelae from acquiring a, a, a very serious form of this. So I think the risk benefits logic has not sunk in yet for the vaccine. Okay. My, my, ba my baseline for risk evaluation is driving in an automobile. Okay. Cause that's probably oh, right. the most, that's probably the most dangerous thing I do on a day-to-day -day basis. That's absolutely okay? right. And, 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 you know, they, they talk about the vaccine as being, you know, one of the, one of the issues here is that, you know, you're administering these <clears throat> vaccines to people who are, who are healthy. Okay. Uh, right. As opposed to the risk associated with the therapy. Well, I'm healthy when I get in a car as well. So, uh, it, uh, it, you're right, Amy. It's a you, you don't know you don't know where to draw the line, but that's true. The risk of nowadays, the risk of getting COVID and getting seriously ill and dying, is uh, much greater than yeah, the risk of of the adverse effects of these vaccines. Well, that's so, what I'm thinking, and the, the other point. thing I'm thinking is, you know, I don't come <laughs> back from debt. I mean, if you know somebody who did, I'd like to meet them because I just happened I've, once. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, I'm um, Jewish, sweetheart. The, um, <laughs> I think that's a combination of, first of all, as someone said, these are new vaccines and people, and for birth control, people have accepted the risk. For driving, people have accepted the risk. Maybe they will accept it at some point for these vaccines. I think that's how you have to look at it, right? Yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, I, mean, I, you know, to me, to me, the important thing is that this has shown up as potentially a signal, okay? 
So it makes perfect sense to focus in on this and see if they can figure out what's yeah, going on. Because Absolutely. if you can understand what's going on, you may be yeah. able to, to limit right. the uh, yeah. impact of this. Yeah, That's I'm it. not arguing that. I'm just yeah, trying to agreed. understand the logic of sure. why, I, why I would not take this vaccine. That's all I'm trying to understand. Because there's lots of things that we do that are risky that we just accept doing, like, you know, Getting in a car, taking birth control pills, smoking, blah, blah. drinking, right? Add exactly. A whole bunch of things I mean, to that you list. Can, right. You can add like a gazillion things. So eating that's red all. meat. <laughs> yeah, right. Yep. I mean, come you know, on. I'm just, that's all I'm. 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 I'm saying. Yeah, we hear. We hear you. And all right. The um, other thing is, is to address your the thing about new vaccines. Well, you needed a better marketing campaign. What can I say? <laughs> That's uh, Amy. Can you take the next one, please? Um, Carson writes, dear Twivers, I'm currently listening to Twiv for 740, where you mentioned trying to make one episode a week about non-COVID topics. I'm excited. I only found Twiv during this pandemic, but I am a research assistant in infectious disease immunology lab, and I'm starting a microbiology PhD program at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, or UAB in the fall, hoping to focus on virology or viral immunology. Here are a few topics I'd love to hear you all discuss. One, I've seen a lot of buzz about this HIV vaccine. Is it warranted? I feel like I often read about scientific breakthroughs only to never actually hear, hear about them again because they didn't live up to the hype. <laughs> and he gives a link. And... Uh, is this the one that is the mRNA-based no. HIV vaccine? No, this is the one out of Scripps um, that was announced last week where they, you know, they're trying to figure out how to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies. Yeah, and, well, good luck. <laughs> so but, um, they think they that, have. We've tried that multiple times, not work. They think they have. Okay. Yeah, well, good luck. Two, I'd love to hear more in-depth discussion about Ebola and the current outbreak. I still need to go back and listen to your episode from the 2014 epidemic, but I want to keep up with the current research as well. I was admittedly disappointed when you started discussing it the other day on 731 and moved sh and shortly moved on to COVID. However, there was a nice nature. What did I send you the other yesterday paper about the epidemic in Ebola, like nature microbiology or something like yesterday? Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. Something that they, they do all this genetic sequencing and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> of, <laughs> look, it was one out of like 15 papers I read yesterday and most of them were on see. my current grant writing. So let's think about this. Oh, Ebola, yeah, listen. current here, here grant it is. writing. Here, I'll read you the title. Integration of Genomic Sequencing into the Response to Ebola Outbreak in Nor Kivu DRC. So it's about how they are doing genome sequencing. Yeah, and we, I think uh, that they talk about it from like 2018 to 2020. Yeah, that's right. It's a genome uh, sequencing effort. Uh, 744 new genomes. Uh, and previously, there were only 48 genomes available. So that's a lot. These are from the DRC. And from it, they can look at the transmission dynamics and so forth. So it's all about the surveillance system, which is good. It's what they need. Which is good. Yeah. So you can discuss it on TWIV 746. Of course, I'm excited to hear anything you discuss, but I'm particularly interested in these two topics. I'll, voila, look at those papers. I also love the recent 725 on flaviviruses. Dengue is probably my favorite virus. You should change viruses immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Picarder's on their way to go. <laughs> Thank you for all, all you do to communicate science, Carson. I wonder if it's the this same, the Carson. same Carson as I don't the know. previous. Like the the emails know. were right by, right next to each other. I didn't notice. I didn't see if the email address was the same or not. I don't know. Well, it sounds like it sounds like we got a convert. Carson's going to stick with us. That's good, good thing. That's well, good. that's good. But he needs to convert. Well, viruses. we we chatted briefly about Ebola virus today. Yeah, um, we did. I mean, right in now. terms of the Ebola outbreak in Guinea, I'm really interested to see the paper where they say. You know, the origin was really a person that had been infected for five years or something. You know, <laughs> we don't have that yet. That's Not interesting. Yet. Dixon, can you take 
The next Ken, one. Abby writes, at least Abby, these are the same Abbies in both cases. Uh, again, two Abbies. Um, apologies if this has already been shared. And uh, now uh, she lists a uh, FDA grant, uh, EUA for COVID-19 screening device for asymptomatic hmm. people. Hmm. I'd love to know how many people out there that were asymptomatic had this infection. Source, Medscape, and what then she is- gives the date. We don't have and, any. I presume uh, this is one of her grants. She's got this grant. Uh, no, she's, no, she's just a, telling us. FDA a, grants an EUA. Okay, so uh, FDA has apparently oh. uh, um, given this company yeah. emergency use only permission for this test. So uh, if I paste that in here, okay, okay. Yeah. I get the Medscape article. I can't get into it. And yeah. All right. I can't see it all because I'm not registered. Okay. But here's another one. It <coughs> so is... Abby uh, writes. Wait a minute. Hold on. Let me just say a little oh, bit more about this. Tiger Tech Solutions is the name of the company. That, Tiger uh, Tech Solutions. Tiger Tech Solutions. You wear this device around your arm for three to five minutes. It displays a light. Whether it found biomarkers of conditions such as hypercoagulation, oh blah, blah, blah. Hmm. Interesting. If true. Interesting. Well, they got an EUA, so this must be something there. We hadn't heard of it. Thank you, Abby. You can read the next Abby, Dixon. Thank you. Uh, Abby writes, dear VDRKB, and he left out A, or she left out A, um, got a dose 1 O Pfizer yesterday, or as I've been saying, D1P. <laughs> Huge space in Nashville's music center. Garage parking lot free. When exiting with your VAX card, clear signage, staffed at every turn, FEMA, Homeland Security, EMT, FD, PD, HD, you name it, they were there. They're prepared for lines as long as the Appalachian Trail with floor markers and even chairs as you near the end. But we whizzed right through. We were in and out in one hour. That's whizzy in some places. Scheduling our first dose was simple. And the appointed line time was a forgiving one-hour block. No appointment needed when we return for DP, uh, D2P. We just show up at any time between 8 and 4 p.m., any day within the range. The site is reporting 2,000 shots administered per day. It was a sparkling example of efficiency and competence. And, of course, I wore my TWIV shirt. And then she shows the picture of her getting vaccinated in her TWIV shirt. <laughs> Thumbs up. That's a charming self-portrait. I love it. And nice. um, she uses this on the cover of our homepage. <laughs> uh, you know, I like the way she cut out a little bit in the front there. Yeah, I was, I was well, going to ask whether that's her own modification. I guess. Of the I don't know. Shirt. Why well, would you do that, that no, Amy? Do you have any idea? A, uh, no. It's I, a, I, this I have fashion, an ex- no, fashion. I've got an explanation. This is a plaque assay, and you're looking at the, the first plaque. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, is this a fashion statement to cut out? Yes, the, yes it is. is. So isn't, like there, isn't there a Rolling Stones song that says, it's just a shot away, it's just a shot away? Uh, I believe there is a song about that. I think so, yeah. And I think okay. that would be quite appropriate right here. It's... Uh, that's the one from. I, I know what you mean, but you know she's got a little thing around her neck. It looks like a butcher, a butcher cleaver, doesn't it? Oh, you know the yeah, thing. It does. You, it isn't does. that funny? It does. It does. <laughs> cool. I like the. Uh, uh, I'm. I'm interested too in the uh, gentleman giving the vaccination. It's like a paramedic type. Yep. I oh, just yeah. really, you know, mm-hmm. anytime I uh, uh, deal with something like this, I'm really impressed with all the people who volunteer their time. No question. You know? yeah. And hey, all no of the question. skills, all of the skills out there that are applied to this kind of thing. It's amazing. You the whole thing so is right. amazing. You are so right. We rallied around this flag. We really did. I, I heard that we have up to 28% of the country has been immunized with at least one dose now. Uh, it's even more than that. It's, uh, it? over 30%. The New York times, uh, uh, has a daily update on this, and I will look it up for you. Uh, but it increases by about one percent a day. That's because they're giving out they're remarkable. giving out four million three million a day. A day. Excellent, a excellent, day. Excellent. Right. excellent. I love uh, the, this. Uh, thank you for telling us. I love that it's efficient. It's great. Um, I hope yeah. people are going, and I love that you wore your T-shirt. It's really a nice color for the it's, for it's the almost shirt. Almost like a party. <laughs> Good job, Abby. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, it's hold, hold on. I got it right here. It's uh, at least one dose, thirty six percent. Thirty six. Wow. Fully fully vaccinated, twenty two percent. Okay. Excellent. So maybe we should send her another shirt and tell her not to cut a hole out of it. Just no, leave it, it as a, I think it looks good. I think it looks, good. Think it's the way it is. <laughs> think it looks pretty good, Dixon. Sorry. Right. It's not, not no just complaints. got the holes. It has no, no complaints. Did she roll up the sleeves or did she cut off the uh, sleeves? You can't tell. Ah. I, I, you can't tell because the right sleeve has got her uh, hand in front of it. The left sleeve is rolled up. So this is a custom twib shirt then. Oh, custom, absolutely. Customized. Got it. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't pull that off, but she can pull it off. It looks good on her. You know, maybe there ought to be a fascist statement in the vaccine era where you rip off one sleeve. <laughs> That's a good one. Oh, yeah. I like that. <laughs> and then the other time you come in, you can rip off the other sleeves. Now you've there got you both go. those. So, yeah, I like that. Except for the Johnson & Johnson, of course. <laughs> so she's smart because she wore a T-shirt. You know, I get vaccinated with this damn thing, and I have to unbutton it and yeah, slip course, it down course, right of course, over. Of course, of course. Pain in the neck. Indeed. All right, one more here from Regina or Regina, whatever. Hello, Twiv people. <laughs> I like that. I have a very important question. What the hell is a person day? Is this the immunology version of a light year? <laughs> you guys remember the paper we did where they talked about person day? So what's a person day? Uh, just the number of people divided by the number of days? Uh, I in, suppose, yeah. In your study, right? Yeah. Backstory. My boyfriend and I were finally able to get our first dose of the vaccine, and now he is asking, so when are we protected? Of course, my answer was two weeks after the second dose, because I am all about those expert recommendations. But because we are both stubborn humans who love to be correct and cannot wait to go to a gym, he started sending me papers such as early rate reductions of SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 and BNT162B2 vaccine recipients. I read the paper and came come to the same conclusion as before. I didn't become a hermit for a whole year to mess up now over a couple of weeks. But I came across the idea of a person day and my brain cannot compute. <laughs> I then tried to find a prospective study looking at the efficacy after a single dose and found this paper, Interim Estimates of Vaccine eff Effectiveness of BNT162B2 and mRNA, et cetera. That's the MMWR paper that we uh, brought yeah. up. And again, with the person day thing, I study plant immune responses and we don't have plant days, leaf days, <laughs> nothing like that. So please help me understand what is happening here. A baffled, partially vaccinated nerd from 80 Fahrenheit, 10,000% pollen, Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, another Birmingham. Regina, P.S., I'm sure I could Google this, but where's the fun in that when the TWIV team could <laughs> potentially answer my question instead? That's a delightful So let's, letter. can we go Indeed. through the, the numbers? So if you had a study where you had, you followed 500 people for 500 days, that would be one person day, right? Do I got it right? Yep. Yeah. And part of the deal in this study was that they followed a number of individuals uh, uh, assessing, uh, reevaluating individuals repeatedly over a number of days. So yeah. you got uh, many more days than people, okay? Well, you um, have to. And, so, and so that's how you wind up with person days. Yeah, it's a similar <laughs> I, thing I, to- I, I, I confess that I had the same sort of uh, like, what <laughs> reaction to person days, but I didn't uh, probe it as thoroughly as has nerd Regina. I mean, this is a similar thing to calculating how long it takes to do a certain task by how many sure. people, right? Yeah. If it takes five people to do that's something right. in a day, that's five person days, right? Yeah, that's right. Similar exactly. idea. The WHO exactly. has a daily uh, to measure the effects of uh, diseases over lost time. And the days, you know, it's a, it's a complicated um, calculation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't really understand why it's even a factor into this because you uh, the development of antibodies is a, is an, is a reaction that has a rate. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how many people you have, how many people you enroll in your study, how many days you sample them. You're not going to, it takes X amount of days to make 
a, a antibody. It takes 10 months to make a baby. Doesn't matter how you, how many people you put in your study, how many pregnancies you look at, it's 10 months. You mean you can't divide 10 pregnancies no. over a thousand people? No. <laughs> no. 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 Doesn't work that way. Yep. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. Like it takes you a minimum of two weeks to make an antibody response. Uh, so there's a reason why you'd want to do things in person days, um, just to give you an, an, an idea of what, uh, I mean, what uh, was involved in the study, right? I don't remember the, the particular MMWR. I don't know. I, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, all I care about is the rate of the reaction to make an antibody and how long that is going to be. Um, well, and so you can enroll 500,000 people. It's not the average, you know, it's plus or minus because you have some discrepancy about when you got enrolled and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, natural variation, plus and minus probably half a day. I, uh, um, I appreciate I appreciate her comment here. I didn't become a hermit for a whole year yeah, to mess yeah. up now over a couple of weeks. That's good. Here, here. That's right. I agree with that. All right. Let's do some picks. Dixon, what do you have for us this week? Well, I have uh, the surprise of the century, perhaps, if it's true. Um, it's a uh, New York Times article about the potential discovery of a new um, fundamental particle um, of matter. And it was derived from experiments where they took muons, which are heavy electrons, and blasted them into each other and then saw what comes out of the explosion, basically. And they've got this little particle that they couldn't explain the activity of. They saw it in Brookhaven many years ago and just thought it was an aberration of their calculations. But mm -hmm. they've seen it again now with the Hadron Large Collider. And um, if it's true, if, if the axion does actually exist, it will uh, force a rearrangement of all the fundamental particles, which they're up to around 19 now, I think. Um, I just thought it was fascinating to find out that uh, it it really, it took a machine that big in order to find out that we are still made out of smaller and smaller bits of matter. Hmm. You know, we study viral particles. Well, that's, I picked this one just because it was the ultimate particle. <laughs> Is it pleomorphic, Dixon? <laughs> it's pleomorphic. No, 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 I won't go there. No, but it's probably going to charge. Yeah. But they said that if we can account for the axion as a particle, we may be able to explain dark matter and dark energy. Hmm which is a big cool. mystery. They have a quote by one of the physicists that said, this is our Mars rover landing moment. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. That's Very right. Cool. And so I thought it was, um, and they show the picture of the Hadron Large Collider too, which is quite amazing. Wow. Neat. Yeah. Rich, what do you have for us? I made a video, <laughs> which I posted on YouTube. Called SARS, uh, called uh, COVID nineteen, SARS CoV two, viruses, vaccines, and variants made easy. Okay, this is not a polished thing. It's me <laughs> being my dry self, <laughs> giving a PowerPoint presentation. But uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna elaborate a little bit here. First of all, I want this is a, a fascinating evolution. I want to shout out to Neva, like ten years ago or something when she first, before I ever moved to Austin, way before I ever moved to Austin, where she wrote into us on a regular basis, uh, signing off as Neva from Buta, which drew our attention to Buta and to Neva. Neva and I are now fast friends, okay? Uh, and Neva had an association with the Buta, Buta Library. And so in the pandemic, the Buta Library approaches me and says, uh, we want to learn about viruses. And that was the initial seed for this hmm. presentation. Uh, that is, how do you explain viruses uh, to basically the lay public? Um, and uh, that's evolved over time through a number of different, you know, these Zoom meetings of one sort or another with uh, different groups, including a uh, second one uh, with uh, the Buta group. Uh, and I finally came up with something that I thought was uh, ready for prime time. It hmm. describes how viruses work and uh, how the, all the different uh, platforms, uh, vaccine platforms work and a little bit about uh, variants 
And so there you go. Yeah, and cool. I hope that Very good. I hope your grandma can uh, can uh, look at this and uh, learn something. Nice. That's the point. All right. Very good. Uh, Amy, what do you have for us? So a bunch of the lay public has been, uh, they've been making anthems and <laughs> videos about getting vaccinated to very like old time popular songs <laughs> like uh, Pat Benatar's Hit Me Your Last Shot or Hit Me With Your Best Shot, whatever it was. And some Billy Joel song like <laughs> Big Shot and stuff. And I just thought that they were funny. It's cool. So, some of them actually have vaccinated and antibodies and immune in the title already. Yeah. Wow, it's so, cool. I thought they were fun. A shot and, in the arm. I like that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, nice. And they're just like, a shot away. Of, you, did you? Did they do the? Do the yeah, uh, the Rolling Stones? Stone song that we just discussed. Is that I, don't in there? Could, I don't know. I <laughs> I looked at. To be honest with you, Dixon, I looked okay. at three. Okay. I thought it was really cool. And right, then right. you know, I have the attention span of a twelve-month-old. You know, I had to move on rather rapidly. <laughs> I'm going to go look for it, though. I'll, I'll find yeah. it. I bet you somebody's. I don't see it right here, Dixon. I think you've got a project in front of you. Hey, I'll um, just call Mick up and ask him if he's willing. Uh, well, you know, given your rendition <laughs> of uh, uh, <laughs> the poem to the tune of Mr. Sandman, oh. I think you have all the skills oh. necessary to do that. <laughs> That's Gimme Shelter, Dixon. That's the name of that song. Yeah, Gimme Shelter. Gimme Shelter. Very cool. That's neat. So, yeah, I thought it was nice. Kind of cool. That's neat. Uh, my pick is a, is a podcast episode. Uh, the, the podcast is called Dark Net Diaries, and I it just appeared on my podcast player. I don't remember picking it, you know, but they had – it's about cybersecurity or as my son would say, infosec. So, Dad, we don't, we don't do cybersecurity. We do infosec. We do information security. So um, – it's well done, and I like this one episode, 86, about the LinkedIn break-in many years ago, 2012. Um, a hacker in Russia broke into the LinkedIn database and stole the emails and passwords and so forth, millions and millions of them. And this is the story of it. And he sold them to, to buyers, and then LinkedIn didn't find out for many years, uh, and it's, he did a great job. He researched it all, and he's just him with some music in the background. It's well done, and uh, I, I was really riveted listening to this. So Excellent. I'm continuing cool. to listen uh, to the rest of them because he talks all about exploits, and there are many, many podcasts about that out there, but this was pretty good. It was well done. It's like kind of uh, a detective story, I would say. So that's pretty cool. Nice. Cool. We have a listener pick from Steve. Hi, Vincent and fellow Twivsters. I would imagine that the singing enthusiasts in the team must be familiar with the highly imaginative <laughs> productions of Randy Rainbow, yes. but I don't recall them being mentioned. Uh, there are so many brilliant ones to choose among, but I thought Vincent in particular would love this one, and he <laughs> picks one called Cover Your Freaking Face, a Randy Rainbow <laughs> song parody. <laughs> That's really funny. Uh, it would make a good alternative title music for the show while the pandemic continues. It's a shame YouTube's algorithms didn't alert me to RR sooner, but there are many works of sheer genius to dip into in the repertoire he's been able to produce on his own at home during the lockdown. Great listeners pick, I think. Many thanks for all your good work. I'm afraid that I can't retain very much of the information, but it is very enjoys and enjoyable listening for its own sake. <laughs> <laughs> Best wishes, Steve, in Luton, England, where it's looking nicely spring-like with the plum blackthorn blossom out and the sun shining. Love it. I haven't what heard from Steve in a long time. He used to write a lot and always end with what's going on in the weather there in, uh, oh, nice. in England. So thank you. Good to hear from you again. I'd not heard of Randy... Randy Rainbow. I've heard of Randy Rainbow, but I don't I've know seen one of his it. songs, yeah. but it wasn't about the COVID virus. Okay. That'll do it for TWIV743. The show notes are at microbe.tv. <laughs> send us your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. If you want to send one to Daniel, that's daniel at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. 
Dixon de Pommiers at trichinella.org and the pleomorphic living river.com. <laughs> Thank you, Dixon. Uh, you're welcome, Vincent. Uh, uh, as Rich would say, always a good time. And I think that's, I could ditto that tonight. Uh, a great time. I, I don't, I just fooling around with the pleomorphic because, uh, we used it a lot today, but your living river has nothing to do with pleomorphism, I think. No, no, it doesn't. But it does meander, and it does change shape. So I think that <laughs> <laughs> rivers do meander. Yes, yes, the rivers do meander. As we do. Uh, Rich Conda <laughs> is an emeritus professor, University of Florida Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. <laughs> and Amy Rosenfeld is here at Columbia University. She, you can find her at antrovirus.net. Thank you, Amy. My pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>